back and talk about what may be the most exciting scientific discovery um, in history that happened a few months ago. And it may or may not be, we don't know. And, uh, um, and I will say that I, I just uh, wrote a Scientific American article on this, which appeared today, in fact, and, um, and I think they have some copies of it here, so, uh, um, so it's on my mind. Anyway, let's begin. I hate being on a stage. I don't know, maybe you can't see me if I'm down here. No, you can't, okay. Um, okay, this is uh, the universe we live in, uh, which would be nice if most people lived in that universe. Um, this is this is uh, this is a Hubble Space Telescope picture. The deepest. It's a recent Hubble Space Telescope picture. Actually, it's the deepest image we have uh, in many different colors. This, these are every dot in this image is a galaxy. This is the ultra deep, high color image. So the galaxies are many different colors. If you can look at that, and the blue ones are farthest away. But every dot in that image is a galaxy, and there are 100 billion galaxies in the observable universe. This is a small, small, small bit, and uh, some of you have heard me say this, but just for normalization, if you take a dime-sized hole in, in your hand like this and, uh, and point it up at a dark spot of the sky with a telescope in Chile, for example, right now, you can see about 100,000 galaxies. So it, that, it's an amazing universe we live in, but one of the interesting aspects of the universe, besides the remarkable fact that, of course, as I'll talk about, we're looking back in time. These dark, these little blue things are, are, are maybe galaxies that are almost 10 billion light years away from us. So the light has left 10 billion years ago, and, uh, and well before our sun formed, so that in fact, uh, most of the stars in those galaxies are no longer around. They're dead now, but we're seeing a picture as they looked 10 billion years ago, just as if they took a picture of us, they'd see our, 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 our sun, um, well, in this case, 10, 10 million years ago, which didn't, it didn't exist, so it wouldn't have seen it. Um, if, it if, uh, if they're 10 billion light years away and they take a picture of our sun, by the time they do see it, we'll be gone and our sun will be gone. So um, we, we, uh, the universe is remarkable in every way. Every time we open up a new window, we are surprised, and I'm going to talk about a new window. But the other remarkable thing about the universe is they're the same number of galaxies in all, roughly all directions. There are 100 billion of them, and they're the same number in that direction as that direction as that direction. And that is a mystery, why the universe should be so uniform, because after all, if it's 10 billion or 13 billion years old or so, then the light from one end of the universe has just arrived at the other end of the universe. So how does each end of the universe know that it's supposed to be the same as the other end of the universe? Because no signal can, can travel faster than light. This is a paradox that's been around since the, well, for, since we've known there was a Big Bang. And we have a resolution of it, and I'll talk about that in a second. Now, part of the resolution, this is, a, one, of my, this is one of the many versions of this image. This is a favorite image of mine. Uh, it's called the Ouroboros. <laughs> it goes back to ancient Egypt, actually. But it's a famous myth of a, of a, of a snake eating its own tail. And you'll see many different images if you Google Ouroboros. But the idea of a snake eating its own tail is particularly important because it turns out, if we want to understand this picture, we don't necessarily study the universe on its largest scales, we study it on its smallest scales. Because the great thing about the universe is it's expanding. And that means it was smaller yesterday than it is today, and etc. And that means at a certain point, very close to the Big Bang, the entire visible universe and all 100 billion galaxies, 100 billion stars, all of that energy was contained in a region smaller than the size of an atom. When the universe was about a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old. All of that material and energy was constrained in, to be in a region smaller than the size of a single atom. It's hard to imagine that as being possible, but it is, and it's hard to imagine we can talk about it with a straight face, but we can. But that means, if we want to understand the, the characteristics of the universe on its largest scales, if those characteristics were created when the universe was well, initially created, then to understand that, we have to understand the physics on the smallest scales. And that's remarkable. To understand the universe on the larger scale, so as we look at, at the Earth and the planets and then stars and then galaxies, when we get to the universe on its larger scales, we're really talking about the universe on its smallest scales at the same time. It's a remarkable aspect, and that's what got me interested in cosmology initially, so my, my, I'm a particle physicist by training. But to under, and that's what makes it so fascinating, because 
If we want to understand the universe, we can try and learn about the fundamental forces that make up nature on the smallest scales. And that means we kill two birds with one stone. When we make measurements of the universe, we're learning about the fundamental aspects of nature. And we've learned a lot in the last 30 years, more than I would have ever dreamed at the time. Now, I told you that we are, when we look at those galaxies, we're looking back in time. We're looking back at, uh, further and further away. We're looking back further and further in time. And if the, uni if the universe is 13.8 billion years old, which it is, except in, in Arkansas and Alabama, and <laughs> Ohio and, and Texas and a few other places, um, then you'd think if you, could, if you looked back far enough, you would see the Big Bang. And in fact, that's, poss that's true. The problem is we can't look back far enough. We, we are shielded from seeing the Big Bang because the universe be was opaque, just like these walls. We can only see far back until the time when the universe became transparent. When we're looking back in time, the universe was smaller and smaller and smaller, but it was also hotter and hotter and hotter. And at a certain time, when the universe was about 300,000 years old, the temperature of the universe was about 3,000 degrees Kelvin. And at that temperature, neutral matter can't exist. Atoms get broken apart into protons, electrons, etc. And that means you, instead of having neutral matter, you have a plasma. And a plasma is opaque to radiation. So it's just, again, like this room. If I look out at this room and, and, and stare and, and try and blind this guy with my, my laser, because he's not getting on my nerves. Um, <laughs> um, uh, if I look out at that wall there, I can only see as far as the wall. I can't see past it because the wall's opaque. But I can see the wall because the light from these lights reflects off the electrons in that wall, and the air is transparent. So I can see all the way up to the wall. Well, at the moment the universe became transparent, when it was 300,000 years old, that radiation is coming to us, and we can look out back to that time. That radiation, which was 3,000 degrees then, it's been cooling since the universe expanded. It's now three degrees above absolute zero. It's what's called the cosmic microwave background radiation. And it was what was discovered in, by accident in New Jersey, of all places. Uh, in 1965 uh, or so, by two guys who didn't know what the hell they were doing. <laughs> but, but they won the Nobel Prize anyway, because you don't have to know what you're doing to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> it's true. It's, it, you just have to discover something wonderful, and they did. And what they discovered was this radiation coming at them, and, and they didn't even know what it was, but that's a different story. But now we can observe that radiation, and if we get a picture using that radiation, we get a picture of what the universe looked like when it was 300,000 years old. And that's this picture. In fact, this picture, two Nobel Prizes have been given for this picture because it's a baby picture of the universe. Now, this is, this is the universe looking out at a sphere located 13.8 billion light years away in all directions. But it doesn't look like a sphere. That's because it's projected like a map. So if this was a, a map of the surface of the Earth, like North America would be there, and South America there, and Africa, and Europe, and Australia, and Asia, so we can project, you know, and this, is, this would be the equator. We can project that surface in all directions onto a two-dimensional plane. So this would be up and that would be down if we're looking at it, okay? And this is the plane of our galaxy. And what we're seeing here is radiation coming at us and, it, and the, the, the color represents the temperature of this radiation. Very slight temperature differences. The radiation on average is three degrees. But the red spots are on average about one ten thousandth of a degree hotter than the average, and the blue spots are one ten thousandth of a degree lower. So this is really uniform on larger scales, except for these very small fluctuations. And what we're seeing, these temperature differences represent essentially lumps of matter. Primordial lumps that would later collapse to form all the galaxies and stars and people and aliens and everything that makes up the universe today. So this is a baby picture of the universe and these primordial lumps were presumably put in at the beginning of time. And we want to understand that. In fact, the first person to give a picture of this who later won the Nobel Prize, my friend George Smoot, um, said when he first saw this image it was like looking at the face of God. It was an awful analogy. <laughs> um, it, it, you can see other faces in it. It's kind of looking at clouds and seeing things, making them up. But 
This is a remarkable picture, but it's not the beginning of time. It's 300,000 years after the beginning of time. And if we use light, this is the as far back as we'll ever see. We can't see back further than that. And so we've done a lot based on this. But, and, and I've you know, written a whole book about what we can do based on this. But to look back further, we have to look for something that can make it through all of that plasma from the beginning of time. And light can't. Okay? Light interacts too strongly. So we have to look for something that doesn't interact so strongly with matter. Now, oh yeah, by the way, I should, this, this is this image cleaned up. We took off the galaxy. The galaxy just gets in the way. And uh, this is the primordial early universe with all these lumps. And later on, these would collapse. These, by the way, the individual size, each of these small lumps is so big, it would encompass a supercluster of galaxies today. So each of these little, little pixels, if you wish, would essentially today be 100 million light years across. So these are very large scale lumps. And how did they get in at the beginning of time? Well, we have, we've had ideas, and I've written about them. But to really know, we have to go back to the beginning of time and check. And what's amazing is we can do that, we think, in the last few months. OK. I'll put that there, just so you can look at that instead of me. <laughs> it turns out there's something much, there are many things that interact with radiation much weaker than light. But the thing that interacts the weakest with us is gravity. Gravity is the weakest force in nature. It's a surprise for most people when they hear that because it's the first sort of force you experience when you wake up in the morning and try and get out of bed. And so gravity doesn't seem so weak, but it is really weak. And, and the best uh, example of that that I can think of was, came from Richard Feynman, um, who gave a great example of how weak gravity is. So and you can do this experiment uh, at, this, at this very hotel. So take... Um, Take uh, Neil Tyson up. No, take a friend up. To, <laughs> take a friend up to the top, or someone up to the nineteenth floor, and open the window and push them out. And um, okay, don't that's, don't try that at home. Okay. It would then take say it's about two hundred feet to the nineteenth floor, ten feet per floor or so. It would take two hundred feet for gravity to accelerate that person all the way to the ground. But electromagnetism stops them in a fraction of an inch. They don't even make a dent in the concrete. Because the reason you don't fall through things is be it's not because it's empty space here. It's because the electric charge of the electrons in your hands gets repelled by the electric charges in the atoms in this material. And so that's what stops you. That's what causes the rather unfortunate end of that little trip. And so the entire mass of the Earth is dragging you down. It takes 200 feet to accelerate you to that velocity using all of the mass of the Earth and the electrons in the, in the ground stop you in a fraction of an inch. Gravity is extremely weak. Now that's a bad thing and a good thing. It means it's incredibly difficult to detect the gravity of small objects. Virtually impossible. You need big objects like the Earth or galaxies. On large scales, gravity is the dominant force in our universe. But Je Einstein told us in, in a, a, a hundred years ago almost, it's almost a centenary of this theory, in general relativity, that gravity is really a manifestation of a curvature in space and time. That matter curves space. Matter distorts space. You distort space by your presence. And, it, and by the same token, just as an electric charge disturbs the electric field around it, and if I shake an electric charge, Maxwell told us 150 years ago, that if I shake an electric charge, I produce an electromagnetic wave. That discovery led to modern, the modern civilization we live in. Einstein told us in 1916, and he said it would never be observable. He was wrong many times. If you just move any mass, anytime you move a mass, anytime I wave my arms, and I'm very good at waving my arms, <coughs> I disturb space around me. I produce a distortion in space, and that distortion propagates out at the speed of light. I produce what's called a gravitational wave. So anytime you move a mass, you produce a gravitational wave. Anytime you move energy around, you produce a gravitational wave. But gravitational waves are very, very weak because gravity is so weak. 
But here's what a gravitational wave looks like. If it was coming out of this wall towards you right now, what a gravitational wave does, it's called a quadrupole wave. What it does is it squishes space in one direction and stretches in another. So if a gravitational wave, and there are many coming through this room right now, but if, a, if a, every gravitational wave that comes from here in this direction makes the length of this room a little bit shorter in that direction and a little bit longer in that direction. And that, that disturbance propagates out, and here's a nice sort of three-dimensional picture of what a gravitational wave looks like um, propagating. And so, gravitational waves distort space. And so you might think, great, we can detect gravitational waves by looking at a distortion of space. And that's true, except the distortions of space are very small. Bold people have tried to do this. And this, um, this is the largest gravity wave detector we have, called the LIGO detector. There are two of them, one in Hanford, Washington, and one in Louisiana. And they're amazing. These devices are involve two arms that are four kilometers long. You can't even get the whole one in this image. Four kilometers long. And if a gravitational wave comes down from up here, what it will do is it'll shorten the length of this arm and lengthen the length of that arm. And so this detector was built to try and look for gravitational waves. To try and look for gravitational waves from among the most dramatic motions of mass in our galaxy. For example, when two neutron stars, each containing the mass of our sun but the size of Manhattan, collide, they produce a hell of a lot of gravitational waves. And this detector was designed to detect them. But the gravitational waves are pretty weak. And this detector as it actually works. But it, here's the requirements for it, and this is what it does. And again, no science fiction writer worth their salt would ever claim this. So this detector works, well, the way it works is you send a light ray in that direction, bounce it off a mirror in that direction, have it come back here, a light ray in that direction, and bounce off a mirror and come back there. And then you just see how long it takes those two light rays to go out and come back, and if the length of one is shorter and longer than the other, it takes a little bit longer for that light to get back to you. <coughs> Sounds easy. What? What this detector can do is tell, look for a difference in the length of each of these two arms, four kilometers, a difference in length that's equal to one one hundredth the size of a proton. It is amazing that that is possible. It is truly amazing that we can do that experimentally. I, when this first detector was first proposed, I just thought there's no way the technology at the time could ever produce that. To measure that, one one hundredth the size of a proton, but we can do it and they can do it. But they still haven't seen any gravitational waves. Because gravitational waves are so weak. And just mere collisions of neutron stars are not strong enough. Now, the detector actually is being upgraded into advanced LIGO, and it will be able to detect a difference in, in length at four kilometers of one one thousandth the size of a proton within a few years, and then we think it should see stuff. Okay? But it turns out there's another source of gravitational waves. Much stronger than colliding neutron stars or colliding black holes or even colliding galaxies. That source of gravitational waves is essentially the creation of our universe, which involved a hell of a lot of energy. Now, where would you look for it? Another remarkable device. This is a picture of, a, of an amazing telescope located at the South Pole. This is the BICEP-2 telescope. And, and, uh, and this is a scientific facility. We have the National Science Foundation runs a scientific facility at the South Pole. It's a great place to do astronomy for many reasons. Um, it's very dry, it's very high, uh, and, you, and we can look. And the, in fact, it was here that we can look for the cosmic microwave background radiation most effectively, because there's not much background and it's very dry, and the, and the microwaves get absorbed by water. And so it's a wonderful place to do this. And this is a microwave background telescope. Now, it's not so easy, uh, e even though the, the uh, South Pole is relatively cold, it's not cold enough, because you want to measure things very precisely. So we have to do things like this. There's the telescope in the background on these big uh, cargo planes, which can only land, many of you may know this, but the first time I learned this, it shocked me. You can only land in the South Pole during the summer. 
Yeah, we can go to the moon, we can go to under the, the oceans, but planes only land in the South Pole in the, in the summer. They don't land in the South Pole in the winter. So you, when you're there, and some of my students have been there for the once you start the winter, you have to stay there all winter. And, and you have to be tested psychologically for all that and all that stuff. But, but during the good months, we'd ship things like liquid helium containers to cool that thing down to just a, a less than a degree above absolute zero, so it can detect things. And then this bicep detector is left for the winter, and this is sunset at the South Pole. How many times does sunset happen in the South Pole? Think about it. Once. Yeah, after this it's dark for six months. So this is that moment when you go from summer to winter and then, and then you're stuck, okay? And the, the telescope is left in the winter months with operators who live there to look. And this telescope is claimed to detect signals from the beginning of time, gravitational waves from the beginning of time. And I want to explain to you how it's done. So, Remember I told you that it's a mystery how the coming universe is so uniform in all directions. Why, why does that over there know what's happening over there? Well, in 1980, a young physicist named Alan Guth came up with an idea, and it was a well-motivated idea, it turned out. He said, well, maybe it's possible that at very early times, the universe puffed up very fast by a huge amount when the universe was a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second old, it puffed up and increased in volume by a factor of 10 to the 90th in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. So it went from the size of an atom, smaller than the size of an atom, to the size of a basketball in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second. Now he proposed that for reasons I'll get to in a moment, but realized that that would solve all the problems. Because you see, if this, if this is our standard universe, it's very big nowadays, and in the standard model, it would have been some size, it would have been getting smaller and smaller and smaller. But if this period called inflation happened at some very early time, then our, our universe would have once been much smaller than we would imagine otherwise. A factor of 10 to the 90th in volume smaller. And if it was much smaller, there would have been enough time at that time for all of the universe to communicate like to travel across that whole region which would become our observable universe, make it uniform, and then it would puff up to be the size, uh, and, and then eventually expand to the size of the today. So everything that is now just beginning to be in contact again was once in contact much earlier. And that would explain the uniformity of our universe. But, during, uh, why does the universe puff up? It turns out it puffs up for the same reason our universe is puffing up today, as I wrote, talked about in my last book. If you put energy in empty space, it's gravitationally repulsive, not attractive. As, as, as most physics students know, that gravity sucks. Right? <laughs> but in fact, in this case, it blows. Okay? <laughs> if you put energy in empty space, it acts like kind of cosmic anti-gravity. And you get a repulsive force, and our current universe is expanding faster and faster and faster. Well, Alan Guth realized that if you put a tremendous amount of energy in empty space, huge amount of energy, more, 14 orders of magnitude, that's a million billion almost, a million, it's, uh, well, actually 15 orders of magnitude, a million billion time, times the energy that we produce at the Large Hadron Collider today. A million billion times energy. If that much energy is stored in empty space for a little while, it'll cause the universe to puff up. But that's a hell of a lot of energy. And it turns out if you, a, empty space is full of that much energy, you will generate a background of gravitational waves by the most amazing process. The whole universe starts out smaller than the size of an atom. And quantum mechanics is what operates, and quantum fluctuations are happening all the time. And if gravity is a quantum theory, then there are quantum fluctuations in space. Normally so small that they don't matter. But during inflation, those initial quantum fluctuations in space get stretched out and get frozen. Now exactly the same process, quantum fluctuations in matter, also get stretched out and frozen. They would produce all of the lumps that we now see in the cosmic microwave background radiation 
and all the lumps that would later collapse to form you and me and everything we see. So if inflation is true, and we don't emphasize this enough, we are quantum mechanics. All of the lumps of matter we see in the universe are only there because quantum mechanics is operating on the smallest possible scales. We are manifestations of the existence of quantum mechanics, which is true, it's amazing, it's true. Now it turns out if you predict what those lumps should look like, coming from inflation, those lumps of matter, they look just like the lumps we see in the microwave background. So we say, aha, inflation must have happened. The problem is inflation is a wonderful idea in search of a theory. <laughs> or a hypothesis, as Neil might say. No, a theory. We are in search of a theory, a robust thing that can be tested. And inflation, there are many different versions of inflation, and unfortunately, while it predicts a spectrum that looks exactly like we see today, if that was different, inflation could explain that too. That's not a good thing. If a theory could be consistent with any observation you make, it's not much of a theory. Okay, thank God. <laughs> now, inflation doesn't just produce those lumps, however. As I told you, quantum fluctuations in space themselves get stretched and frozen. And that means they will produce a background of gravitational waves. Now, I think the next image is probably the most complicated one in this whole thing. It happens to be an image from the Scientific American article that just came out since the artist drew it. I thought I'd use it. It took me a long, many, many sessions with the artist to get it right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go over here so I can see better. I'll, I'll go back on stage in a second. So this is a brief history of time. And this is a Big Bang. And then, and this is the universe at the microwave background that we see. There's that microwave background surface. And this is the universe today. Now, shortly after the Big Bang, this period of inflation happened. And these represent little quantum fluctuations in gravity. And they get stretched out. And the quantum fluctuations in gravity that get stretched out first get pushed out the longest. The quantum fluctuations of gravity that get pushed out just before inflation ends are only the size of basketballs when inflation ends. Okay, their wavelength is the size of basketballs. So the smallest scale gravity waves, they start oscillating, but as the universe expands, they die off. The next smallest waves oscillate, take a little longer to oscillate, but they die off. And longer waves die off too. But there are gravitational waves whose period is 300,000 years, roughly. And they just start to oscillate when the universe becomes 300,000 years old. Those waves will leave an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. Because remember, what the waves do is they stretch space in one direction and squish it in another. So if I have, if I have a gravitational wave that's just beginning to oscillate, it, and, it, and it comes by, it'll squish space in one direction and stretch it in another. Now let's say I have a little electron here. And like, that, like the wall, those electrons in that wall are absorbing the light from those, those lights and reflecting it back to me. The electrons on that last scattering surface are doing the same thing. They're absorbing radiation and reflecting it out to us. That's why we see them. But if space gets squished in one direction around that electron and stretched in the other, then it turns out that if you have an incoming electromagnetic wave, it turns out the electron sees hotter radiation coming in one direction and colder in another. And it will reflect that radiation towards us to be more intense in one direction than another. That's called polarized radiation. It's what happens, the reason you wear polarized sunglasses if you're a fisherman, is that the radiation that reflects from the surface of the water is polarized, so it's, it's oscillating in one direction. And if you wear glasses that have little molecules that are all lined up in that direction, that polarization can't get through. So you don't see reflections. You can look right into the water. That's why polarizing sunglasses work. But this tells us that if gravitational waves existed at the beginning of time, they would leave an imprint on the microwave background by polarizing it. Now, it turns out it's a very special kind of polarization. There are other things that polarize the microwave background. But if I look at those hot spots and cold spots in the microwave background, and if I can measure the polarization of light, then in principle, I can detect gravitational waves from the beginning of time. Now, this was recognized almost 20 years ago. And it's become the holy grail. And lots of detectors were 
built to try and look for this polarization, including the BICEP2 detector of the South Pole. Now, the interesting thing about the, the polarization that comes from gravitational waves is it's kind of a twisting pattern, like a snake. If that turns out because of the property of the gravitational waves of being what, what are called quadrupole, swishing things in one direction and stretching them in another, if you work it out, they produce a pattern that should look like this, a kind of snaky-like pattern. Whereas other things will produce other kind of patterns, circular patterns, and everything else. So that's really good. That means if you can measure the polarization of the magnetic background and look for that snaky pattern, you might detect gravitational waves. Now, that was the situation at the beginning of this year. And most of us thought, okay, it's a nice idea, it'll never be detected. In March of this year, the BICEP experiment, in fact, I, I helped them in, with the announcement, uh, reported the following observation. This is an observation of a small region in the microwave background with the polarization. And what you can see is exactly what we predicted for gravitational waves coming from the beginning of time. And I'm happy to say it was one of the people who kind of made the prediction. This is if this, if this is real, it is undoubtedly, as I say, perhaps the most important image in the history of science. Because the, the significance of this it takes a little while to sink in. If these really are gravitational waves, then first of all, it's the first detection of gravitational waves. The first detection of these stretching and squeezing of space due to the motion of matter. But more importantly, if, the, if this observation is really true, then these waves were emanating from a time when the universe was a billion of a billion of a billion of a second old. Now the light, I told you, itself emanates from a time when this universe was 300,000 years old. So if this signal is true, we have increased our empirical handle on the universe by a factor of 10 to the 49. We've pushed back the time when we can directly measure properties of the universe from 300,000 years to a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. And that changes everything. That means we can test speculative ideas that were pure speculation and turn them into physics. We can take metaphysics and tur turn it into physics. And it is an amazing observation. And the scientific community went crazy over it because of that. Because if this is true, we can test. If this is true, it also tells us that indeed inflation really happened. That this amazing fact that our universe expanded by a factor of 10 to the 90th in a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a billionth of a second happened. But it tells us more than that. If it's true. And that's a big if. Because it's, it, 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 it looks just like it's supposed to look. But we are scientists. And we don't believe things just because we want them to be true. That's really important. <laughs> I want this to be true more than anything. But it turns out we have to ask ourselves, and Richard Feynman said it, when you get a result, if you're a scientist, you try or have a theory, you try and prove it true, but you also try and prove it false. You spend more time trying to try and prove it false, in fact. Because we're the easiest people to fool. We, we want to believe. And so, when we look at this, we have to say, is it, could there be anything else that could get in the way? Well, it turns out, shortly after this observation was, was reported, it was realized, well, there are other sources of polarization in our galaxy that may also produce polarization, but also a twisty pattern. Particularly, there's dust in our galaxy, little metal particles that are polarized. And when light scatters off them, that light gets polarized. And while the observers who took this snapshot, if you wish, said the dust in our galaxy can't be at that level, a month after that this experiment result came out, another detector in the sky called the Planck experiment measured dust in other regions of the galaxy and found out, you know what, it can be a little bigger than we thought. So it's been recognized that if the dust is three times more abundant than we thought, then you can maybe account for this image. It's consistent, given the uncertainties of the observation. Now, we don't know. It turns out that there are other features of this polarization, it's called so-called spectral dependence, 
And if you look at it, it mimics exactly what you'd expect from inflation and approximately what you might get from dust. So there's another characteristic of it. You'd ask, how, much, how big are the twists on large scales compared to small scales? Turns out that is exactly what you predict from inflation. It's consistent with dust. You know, it turns out that it should, it should go down over small scales and go back up again on even smaller scales. And the data follows that exactly. But there are error bars. And whereas dust predicts a flat line. And the error bar is completely consistent with the flat line. It would be an awful accident, very mean-spirited of nature, <laughs> if the errors are such that, well, the data happened to fall where it was supposed to fall and rise where it was supposed to rise. But it could happen. So while it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, that's not good enough. I'm betting it's real. Because I want to make some money. <laughs> Most of my colleagues would say right now they're betting it's not real. Because it was pretty surprising that it was seen in the first place. But it, what's great about this is we don't have to bet, we don't have to talk, we don't have to believe, we don't have to, you know, kill each other over the whole thing. Because we'll, we'll know. Because this is such an important area, the Planck satellite is actually measuring dust better, and the BICEP experiment is actually collaborating with the Planck experiment to see if they're wrong. Isn't that neat? Observers who, by the way, if this is right, will surely win the Nobel Prize, are collaborating with an experiment to see if they're wrong. That's how science is done. And in November of this year, they're going to report now, I don't know if they'll be able to report a definitive result or not. We'll see. Stay tuned. It turns out it doesn't even matter if they do, because, in fact, there's about 20 different experiments online right now searching for that, that polarization that will be able to tell in different areas of the sky to see if they see the same thing. So in a year, we'll know the answer. But let's, for the moment, assume it's real, because it looks real, and ask what would we learn if it's true. And what we learn, I've tried to indicate to you some of the things we learned, but I want to point out it's even better. So, why does inflation happen? Why does empty space get energy? Well, if I, we're, in, we're not in Phoenix, so I can use this analogy here. It doesn't have to do with immigration or anything. It, it gets cold here, it doesn't get cold in Phoenix, right? And, if it, and, and I was happy to discover it wasn't going to be cold when I flew in last night, because I was prepared for it. But if you look on another day, in a few weeks here, on the window outside this hotel, you'll see ice crystals. Okay? What happens when ice crystals form? Well, you have water, and suddenly it freezes. Okay? Now, if you have, if, if many of you will know that if, it, if, if you have water on the street, and the temperature gets very cold during the day, from above freezing to below freezing, freezing, the water doesn't freeze right, right away. In fact, the water, as there's cars swirling around and everything else, can stay liquid well below the freezing point. And water, if you stir water, you can cool it down to much below freezing. And then let it go and suddenly it'll freeze. That's called a phase transition. Water freezing. It turns out because it's much colder than the freezing point, water would rather be frozen than liquid. The frozen state has much less energy stored in it than the liquid state. So if the liquid is super cold and suddenly freezes, it emits a lot of energy. In fact, the temperature stays constant instead of getting colder because it emits so much energy, it keeps that temperature constant. That's, that's called a metastable, well, that's called uh, that latent heat is what we, we emit in that metastable transition. Now, what Goose suggested is that at, in the early universe, as the universe is cooling, maybe there's some background field in nature. And this is what a phase transition looks like. In fact, if this was a phase transition with water, the liquid state would be up here, and the, and the, and the, uh, the frozen state would be down here. And when the liquid melted, it would emit all that energy. This is the energy of these two different states. He argued that maybe our universe gets stuck in what we call a false vacuum. That field gets stuck in the wrong state. And when it gets stuck in the wrong state, it stores energy in empty space. 
It stores enough energy and empty space for the universe to expand, and then the phase transition happens at some point, and boom, it dumps all that energy and we get a hot Big Bang. Now, how can you get a phase transition in the fundamental laws of nature? Well, we know such a phase transitions occur. They occur when the forces in nature suddenly start looking different. We think all the forces of nature probably result from a single idea, something we call a grand unified theory. And it's a theory, Neil. <laughs> we know this happens because, in fact, we discovered it at the Large Hadron Collider. There are two forces in nature, the electric force, the electromagnetic force, and another force called the weak force, which is responsible for the processes of the power of the sun, and they look very different. One of the triumphs of the 20th century, the intellectual triumphs of the 20th century, is we now realize they are just different manifestations of the same force. And when the universe was a millionth of a millionth of a second old, a field formed throughout all of space called the Higgs field. And that field distinguished between the electric force and the weak force, so they started looking different. The particles that convey the weak force interacted with that field, but the photons, the particles that, that convey light, didn't. And they suddenly started acting differently, even though they're different manifestations of the same thing. So the question is, could there be another phase transition? Well, there's a third force in nature, the strong force. So if the electric and the weak force unify, maybe at some scale, they'll unify with the strong force. This was recognized in the 1970s, and an amazing thing is, it turns out to be true, due to the laws of quantum mechanics, these are the strength of the three forces of nature, non-gravitational force of nature, as measured where we are at the scale that you and I live in. It was discovered that due to quantum mechanics, and relativity. The strength of the forces in nature changes depending upon the scale you measure them at. If you measure the electric force at smaller and smaller scales, it gets stronger. The same with the weak force. The strong force, however, amazingly, gets weaker. The force between quarks gets less strong the closer the quarks are to each other. Something very non-intuitive was discovered in the mathematics in 1973 the Nobel Prize was given for this idea called Atomic Freedom when it was discovered experimentally. That's the case. You bring quarks. Quarks can't be pulled apart because the force between them gets stronger and stronger and stronger the farther apart they are. But the closer together they are, the weaker they are. Well, the strong force gets weaker. These other forces come together. It was speculated in 1975 or so that maybe at a scale a scale of energy 15 orders of magnitude greater than the mass of the proton, 13 orders of magnitude greater than the scale we're measuring in the Large Hadron Collider, maybe all those forces in nature get unified. That's what caused Alan Guth to suggest inflation. Because if they get unified, before that time, all the forces were the same. At that time, some field formed throughout nature and distinguished between the strong force and the electric weak force that field could have stored a huge amount of energy and produced inflation. So he was motivated by particle physics, not by cosmology, to argue that this weird phenomenon may have happened. And now, we see it potentially did. But there's a problem. If all the forces of nature, if all the particles we measure today, at the Large Hadron Collider and every other particle experiment we've ever done, or all the particles there are, we now know from having measured the forces very carefully that they don't come together at a single point. However, if there's a new symmetry of nature, we call it supersymmetry, it predicts that there's a whole bunch of new particles, and if we predict those new particles are just at a scale where the Large Hadron Collider should detect them next year when it turns on, it changes the nature of the theory, and what do you find out? The mathematics tells you they meet at exactly a single point. That scale. Now, if I ask, if grand unification happens at that scale, at 16 orders of magnitude larger than the mass of the proton in energy, or 16 orders of magnitude smaller than the size of the proton in distance, what will be the magnitude of gravitational waves that you produce? You produce precisely the magnitude of gravitational waves that was seen in bison. So it all holds together. And that means 
if FISEP is measuring gravitational waves from inflation, we are testing not just gravity and cosmology, but grand, but grand unification. The, we are, in fact, providing the first test of the unification of the fundamental forces in nature. A test we'll never be able to perform directly in accelerators here on Earth. Because the Large Hadron Collider, as energetic as it is, is only right here. To build a, an accelerator that would smash particles together with enough energy to probe this scale, the radius of that accelerator would have to be the radius of the Earth-Moon orbit. It's not going to happen even aside from political and sociological questions. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So if this is true with the universe, we are testing physics that we can never test directly at the Large Hadron Collider or directly in an experiment. We are testing exactly what the laws of physics are at this energy and therefore at very early times. And this may mean that we can turn inflation from an idea into a theory, because if we can test the physics associated with this phase transition, that's the physics of inflation. Now, there are other places we are trying to test this, other neat places, because it's not just gravitational waves, and I want to show you a picture of one of my favorite places we're trying to detect this. This is in Japan, I've been in this mine. This is the Kamioka mine, this is not the mine itself. This is a large tank of water located in the mine in Japan, where the sun never shines. Located, it's a tank of 50,000 tons of water, 50,000 tons of water, kept with the cleanliness of a laboratory clean room in a, in a working mine, which is amazing. No radiation, no nothing, and it's surrounded by, in a container, with 11,000 phototubes. And it's been left there in the dark for 25 years now, more than 25 years, 30 years. Why? Because if the forces of nature are unified at that incredible scale, then there's not just a connection between the forces of nature, but also all the particles in nature. And there are new connections. And it means that there the particles that make up protons, called quarks, and electrons, and their partners as well, are very different on the scales we see. But on that tiny scale, there are actually different manifestations of the same kind of particles. And that means Protons can turn into, not electrons, but positrons, the, the, the antiparticle of electrons. What does that mean? That means diamonds aren't forever, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> sorry, Mark, I know you're wearing one. <laughs> because it's, it tells us that if it's true that at that very small scale they're unified, then if we wait long enough, even protons will decay. The particles that make us up. And we can calculate, based on our ideas, how long should a proton lot live? Well, it should be about 10 to the 35 years. Which is a long time, maybe not long compared to this talk, but long. <laughs> Certainly, much less long compared to Neil's talk. <laughs> anyway, he asked for it, what can I say? So how can you measure a lifetime of 10 to 35 years? That's a billion, that's a, a billion, billion, billion times longer than the age of our universe. Well, it's simple. Quantum mechanics says if the average proton takes 10 to the 35 years to decay, if you have 10 to the 35 protons in one place, on average, one will decay each year. Where do you get 10 to the 35 protons? Well, you can't get 10 to the 35 protons at 50,000 tons. You get about 10 to the 33 or 10 to the 34. But when this was first built, we thought the lifetime was 10 to the 33 or 10 to the 34. And so this thing has been kept in the dark for 20 years. And if this theory is right, after 100 or 1,000 years, we should see a proton decay. <laughs> <laughs> that is unless the experiment is turned off that day, and then we have to wait another 100 or 1,000 years. But it is amazing that this experiment has been running continuously for that time in the dark, because when a proton decays, it will produce a flash of light, and that's one of the things it's been looking for. And what is nice, I suppose, for these experimentalists is if BICEP is right, and if we can test the physics of brand unification, we will be able to give an exact prediction, not just an approximate prediction, for how long protons should live, and we'll be able to tell them how big a detector they need to build if this isn't big enough. But there's another place we can test this idea, and that is in back, back, back old, at the old Large Hadron Collider. This is a picture of Geneva with the, with the mountains behind it, and the Jura Mountains are in this direction. Here's the Alps, and Mont Blanc, I think, is over there. 
In fact, that's Mont Blanc, I think, right there. Um, this, if you land in Geneva, you'll see the, uh, this is a, an airport. And if you land at the airport and look out, you'll see farmland. Nothing special. But under that farmland is the most complicated and amazing machine humans have ever built. A tunnel that's 26 kilometers around, <coughs> cooled to a temperature of one degree above absolute zero with over five tons of liquid helium. And what we do is we accelerate protons around in that direction at 99.9999 times percent of the speed of light. And then we accelerate protons around at 99.9999% the speed of light in that direction. And they go around many thousand times a second. Here's the border between Switzerland and France. They go across the border, several tens of thousands of times each second without a passport. <laughs> Happily, you actually don't need one to go between France and Switzerland. And we collide them in a few places. And we are trying to, we were trying to recreate the conditions of the universe when it was a millionth of a millionth of a second after the Big Bang. And in fact, we've been able to do that by building the most complicated machine ever built and the most complicated detectors ever built. These, these things, again, dwarf the human imagination. The idea that you never build it. Here's one of the small detectors called the compact muon solenoid. A person is about that size of that canister right there. This compact detector contains more metal than in the Eiffel Tower. And it's just half of the detector. The other half is on the other side of where the camera is. And this detector is, is very complicated, but it, in fact, the magnetic field that it employs to actually determine what's happening when those particles collide is so strong, it's 10 Tesla, it's so strong that although this is 20,000 tons of metal, and the other side is 20,000 tons of metal, and they aren't on wheels, if they were apart by about 20 meters, when we turn the magnet on, they'd be pulled together. That's how strong the magnetic field is. And this detector that has, to, is, that has to be designed to detect collisions of those particles. Collisions that are happening millions of times each second. And the amount of data is almost unfathomable. Every millionth of a second at the Large Hadron Collider, 100 terabytes of data is being generated. More data than exists in all the libraries in, all of, in the whole world every millionth of a second. And you can imagine to handle this data required a whole new type of computing. Which we, and again, you would say it's impossible to do, but it's been done. That's one of the two detectors. Here's the larger detector. It's not so compact. There's a person down there. Um, and uh, this is called the Alice detector. So it's a, well, this is the Alice detector. Sorry, this is another detector. And, um, um, and both these detectors, as you probably know, on July 4th, 2012, detected a few events, or reported the detection of the billions and billions and billions of events that were detected. They detected a few events. Do I have the picture of the events? No, uh, I'll go back, because I'm going to show you a picture of the events in a second. But they detected the Higgs particle. Now, I want to just leave that there for a moment, because I want to end here with the other, for me, the most amazing thing that all of this has come together. We may now understand the early universe back to the, essentially the beginning of time. Validating, I'm happy to say, almost all the ideas that were in my book. <laughs> for those that don't like that. We're learning of the fundamental structure of matter. We're going to be able to test grand unification, but there's something else. We'll be able to get a turn inflation into a theory. And one of the things that inflation generically predicts almost all the time is that this phase transition happens in different places, in different ways. It's just like those ice crystals on a, on a, on a glass, on a, on a plate glass window in the winter. You see ice crystals, when they form, that some of them are, are pointing that direction, some of them are pointing that direction, some of them are pointing that direction. If you lived on one of those ice crystals, your universe would be very special in that direction. If you lived on another ice crystal, your universe would be very special in that direction. Inflation involves a phase transition. And generically, what it means is that at some local place, just like when an ice crystal forms, inflation ends. And all that energy is dumped into a universe. But in the rest of space, space is still expanding very fast. Most of what the real universe is, if you want to call it that, is still expanding. Our universe 
is not all there is. We change what we mean by universe. When I was a kid, universe used to mean everything. Now, universe means everything we could once have seen and everything we will one day be able to see. All that was in which we can ever be in causal contact. But inflation, if inflation is right, our causal universe was formed as a seed when some small region underwent a phase transition. But in the rest of what we now call the multiverse, the universe is still expanding. And in fact, on larger scales, what the universe, what the multiverse looks like is maybe something like this, with universes spawning, and our universe was formed 13.8 billion years ago, but maybe in another region of the multiverse, boom, inflation is ending there and the universe is forming right then. And another region of the multiverse, the universe is ending. That universe. And, and the other thing is, just like inflation, just like a, a ice crystals point in different directions on your plate glass window, when inflation ends, that phase transition can happen in different directions, and that means the laws of physics can be different in each universe. So what it really looks like is kind of this. In some universes there are lots of stars, in some universes there are, there are not so many stars, in some universes there may be no matter at all. This metaphysical speculation that our universe is just one of potentially an infinite number of universes in a multiverse which could be eternal, and by the way could have existed eternally, and, and will continue to exist eternally, is an idea that has recently become of interest. It's an idea that, that, that I talk about a lot in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in my last book. And people, especially religious people, say, you invented the multiverse because you don't like God. And I say, yes, I, that, I don't like God. But that's not the reason we invented this multiverse. We invented it, we proposed it, because we we're driven to it by the laws of physics. But you see, it does have the characteristics of God. It exists outside of our universe. It could be eternal. And the laws of physics in our universe could have arisen only when our universe was created. As I described, and I'm not going to do it here, our universe could come from nothing in a multiverse. So the multiverse does fit the, fit the role of God. Now, that's... That speculation, this is data, this is the Higgs particle, one of the collisions in the Large Hadron Collider that would have tells us there was a Higgs. And that Higgs particle validates the notion that there's, an, there's a field throughout the universe that's invisible. We now know that's the case. Because the discovery of the Higgs, the, the Higgs particle, the Higgs theory tells us if you spank empty space hard enough, it's kind of sadomasochistic, you spank it hard enough in one place, boom, you knock out particles, and that's what the Large Hadron Collider does. But that validates the notion that there could be these other invisible fields. But it also tells us something else. The Higgs transition actually happened. The Higgs phase transition happened. Okay? And we now live in a state where electricity and magnetism are different. In the inflationary transition happened. But we've discovered there's a little bit of energy left in the universe that's causing our universe to expand faster and faster and faster. Maybe that's due to another transition that hasn't yet happened. It's maybe related to the Higgs particle. And if that happens, the universe that we see will disappear. We are here by a cosmic accident, a cosmic accident of inflation that produced random quantum fluctuations that later on produced all of us. That later on, a long time later, when the universe is a millionth of a millionth of a second old, caused another field to relax into a state which gave particles mass and allowed us to exist. We are here by a cosmic accident. There's no planning, no design, no purpose. And perhaps the ultimate realization of that will be that there could be one other phase transition in which everything we see will go away. So as my late friend Christopher Hitchens used to say to me when I explained, even before we knew about this, explained to him what the future was like, he said, well, you know, Nothing is coming towards us as fast as can be. And so if you ask the question, why is there something rather than nothing, the answer he would give would be, just wait, there won't be for long. <laughs> so science has told us, by starting out at looking at these larger scales and just looking with our telescopes, we've gone through an amazing story of amazing detectors and experiments that have changed everything we think about the universe 
and allowed us to have a new window that may take us back to the Big Bang. And the conclusion ultimately is that the future will be more miserable than we ever thought. <laughs> and that is the wonder of science. Thank you very much. Sorry. Uh, my name is David Rich. Uh, Dr. Krauss, you talked about the four fundamental forces yeah. and the relationship between them. And I've heard religious people look at this data and interpret it by saying that the balance between the four fundamental forces requires fine-tuning. And of course, the fine-tuning has to be from their God. So Yeah, that's uh, a good question. So the question is, does the multiverse theory evade the need for fine-tuning, or is the fine-tuning itself just a misunderstanding? Well, it's both. <laughs> the answer is both. But let me, let me explain the first thing and then the second thing. By the way, the universe isn't fine-tuned for our existence. I'll get to that. So every time some religious guy tells you that, you just tell them that's yet another thing they're, they're wrong about. Um, but, but if the multiverse idea is correct, it actually gets around to the very same idea. 150 years ago, the Earth was fine-tuned for life. Special creation told us that every remarkable uh, species on Earth was divinely created because it was perfectly tuned to its environment. And only God, in her infinite wisdom, could somehow create cockroaches and, and, and all the other things. And what Darwin showed beautifully was that's not the case. That you can start out from a single life form and just natural selection will produce an amazing diversity as long as there's genetic mutation, as long as there's variability. And in fact, bees don't see the color of flowers because they're designed to do that. Even though they seem incredibly fine-tuned, they see that because if they couldn't, they couldn't find the nectar and they wouldn't survive and reproduce. So they are not designed, the universe isn't designed for bees. Bees arise for a universe in which they can live. And in fact, it would be remarkable to find ourselves living in a universe in which we couldn't live. That would be worth it. <laughs> or TV series or whatever. So what, what, what in some sense, what, what uh, multiverse theory does is produce a kind of cosmic natural selection. It says there, are many, there may be many different universes, and in the different universes, the laws of physics might be different. So in some universes, life like ours might arise. In other universes, life, the laws of physics may be such that life couldn't arise. It's therefore not too surprising that we find ourselves living in a universe which, with laws that are consistent with our existence. So that fine, apparent fine-tuning just goes out the window. It's just cosmic natural selection. But it's even worse, or better, depending upon your attitude. Because the universe isn't fine-tuned. In fact, it could be much better than it is. For example, one of the things that I was the first one to use, probably maybe the, the word fine-tuning, unfortunately, to describe this energy of empty space many years ago. And a lot of religious people jumped on it. But what it, so we see empty space having energy, but it's a very small amount of energy. It's so small we don't know why it's there and not zero. It turns out if it were much greater than it is, we wouldn't be here. There wouldn't be galaxies, there wouldn't be stars, there wouldn't be life. So that energy of empty space, if it was much bigger, we wouldn't be here. So it looks like it's incredibly fine too. But it turns out the natural value that we used to think it should have is zero. That's a natural value. It's not zero. It's a little bit bigger than zero. But if it was zero, the universe would be far more hospitable to life than it actually is. So if you were a divine creator who was omnipotent, you would have made it zero. Because life could exist for far longer, far better, in a universe in which the energy of empty space is precisely zero. So it's not as if the universe is fine-tuned for our existence. It's compatible with our existence, but it could be much better. And, uh, and, and there are lots of parameters like that, where we, we, we know that, in fact, that the, the, we, we, it turns out we live in, because the energy of empty space is what it is, we live in about the worst of all possible universes that is consistent with our existence. Our future is terminal, precisely because of that, and there's nothing we can do about it. So, you know, if you wanted to design a universe for life, this is not the universe. For life in the long term, this is not the universe you design. So A, cosmic natural selection. I'm, I'm dwelling on this because you're going to hear this a lot for those of you who debate relig religious apologists. The universe isn't fine-tuned, it's just natural selection. And even aside from that, the universe we live in shows no evidence of being tuned for our existence. It's compatible with our existence, but of course it is, because we exist. 
Hi, Dr. Krauss. Hi. I'm Rory Moe. Hi. I've uh, been an amateur astronomer since I was a teenager. Uh, last January, a uh, discovery was announced of a large quasar group, uh, 4 billion light years at its length and an average 1.6 light years uh, its width, and it seemed to challenge the cosmological principle. Has anything been learned in the 21 months or so since then? Well, you know, you should. what's been learned is you should always trust, distrust when you read those things in the paper. Um, Every, every month something is announced that challenges our current wisdom, and often, sometimes it does, but all, you've got to understand that observations on the largest scales are tentative. And in fact, as with the bicep result, the first observations of everything are almost always wrong. We don't publicize that enough. It's, a, it's one of the great virtues of science, not a definite default. It's a virtue because we can then test it. And if you look at the best test of theory of nature, quantum electrodynamics, it turns out all of the first experiments on every fundamental parameter of that theory were wrong by two sigma, by 95%. And so people, people see large structures, and those structures may be there, but the, there's lots of reasons there can be large structures. The simplest reason is it could just be an accident. It just could be an accident. That's the other thing. Remember when I said we want to believe? Are all, we, we tend to like to see structures. We're, we're hardwired to find patterns. And, and the question is, are they significant? And again, Feynman used to point this out to people, because we all think things that happen to us are significant. And so Feynman would go up to people and say, you won't believe what happened to me today. You just won't believe what happened to me. And people say, what? And he'd say, absolutely nothing. <laughs> because you, know, you can have crazy dreams for a thousand nights, and then one night you have a dream that you're friend is going to break their arm and the next day their friend break, your friend breaks their leg and you go, oh, cosmic. It, accidents happen. And so there can be large, you know, structures, okay? It is true that, that the largest structures that can have causally formed by gravity are superclusters. They're about 100 million light years across. We just discovered two weeks ago, and I talked about it on TV, that we actually live in a larger supercluster than we thought. Lana Kea, we all live in Hawaii, we didn't know that. But uh, it's been called Lana Kea because the guys who discovered it were from Hawaii. But it's an amazing cluster. We now know what our home is. That's our home. It's the largest found object we exist in, and it's the largest found object we'll ever exist in because of this energy of empty space. So larger objects than that are not formed by gravity. They may form by an accidental alignment of a bunch of separate superclusters. So we'll wait and see. Hello, Dr. Krasman. Hi. My question is about your latest book on Universe from Nothing. You talked about how cosmologists know that the universe geometry is flat. Uh -huh. Therefore, that means it will continue to expand, not end. How do we reconcile that with our incomplete knowledge of dark matter, and how much dark matter there is, and whether or not that dark matter will cause the universe to collapse? Well, okay. It's a good question, although I actually explained it in the book. I have to not one But um, we actually me measured the geometry of the universe. We've met, and in fact, it's perfectly consistent with the amount of dark matter because there's dark matter and there's also dark energy. It turns out 30% of the universe, the energy of the universe is dark matter. Everything we see is less than 1% of the total energy in the universe. And, and as I often say, we're just a bit of cosmic pollution in a universe of dark matter and dark energy. 70% of the energy of the universe is empty space, 30% of dark matter, and a little bit of noise, 1% plus or minus, is everything we see. So you can get rid of all the stars and all the galaxies and everything we see in the beautiful night sky, and the universe would be essentially largely the same. So, so much, we're just a cosmic afterthought. So much for a universe created for us, okay? We're irrelevant. You get rid of everything we see, and the universe is identical to the way it was before. But we can measure the amount of dark matter, it turns out, by gra measuring gravity. And we've also been able to determine the amount of dark energy by the expansion rate of the universe. When we add those up, in fact, I first proposed in 1995 that dark energy should exist because for re other reasons, I thought the universe was flat. And it turned out the only way to make it consistent was to put energy in empty space. It was a heretical idea that no one believed, probably even me, although I published it. And then I was more surprised than anyone else when three years later, the observers measured exactly what we and of course, they gave the Nobel Prize to the observers, but that's okay. <laughs> they deserve it. They convinced the world. But a lot, so it turns out that everything we measure is precisely consistent with the flat universe. And then it turns out 
that we've actually been able to measure the geometry of the universe. And in my book, I talk a lot about how we can do that. Now, flat means doesn't mean flat like a pancake. It means the universe you always thought you lived in with x, y, and z axes pointing in that direction and the same direction everywhere in the universe. Where in a curved universe, if you take the x, y, and z axis far enough away somewhere else, it's pointing in that direction. So everything is not only, well, everything is amazingly consistent. That's the point. It, many different independent lines of inquiry all lead to exactly the same result, which is one of the reasons we trust it so much. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom Leeds. Uh, this is kind of an old question, but I never had a chance to uh, ask. But uh, you've said, I've heard you quote, that the universe, well, not so much, sorry, uh, the universe is curved. Mm -hmm. And I've heard you said, if you could see far enough, you could see the back of your head. If the universe was closed. If it was closed. So I was wondering if at any point anyone's had, ever had the theory that the universe could expand into itself, basically. Well, it's a, it always expands into itself. I mean, the, the point is that the universe isn't expanding into anything. That's again in this representation. We tend to think of the universe as expanding into something. It's not. It's just expanding. Space is increasing. But it's not like expanding into anywhere. And, and it's hard to think good analogies for that, partly because we're we're, we're three-dimensional beings, and we're thinking of curved three-dimensional universes, which we can discuss mathematically, but it's hard to picture. But, you know, if you take the surface of a balloon, a two-dimensional surface, well, of course we can embed it in a three-dimensional space and then we can see it. But if the two-dimensional surface of the balloon was all there was, and it got bigger, you put dots on the surface of the balloon, all those dots would move farther apart from it. But it's not expanding into anything, because the outside space doesn't exist, and the inside space doesn't exist. It's just the balloon. And so, the balloon, the, if you wish, the universe is always expanding into itself. Now, a balloon is an example of a closed two-dimensional surface, okay? And it is a really good example of that because it doesn't have a boundary, there's no, there's no end. You go around and you come back to where you began, and that's possible for the three-dimensional universe. But it would, if, if the three-dimensional universe, if our three-dimensional space was closed, it would be closed in the same sense that a balloon is, that it could expand, but not into anything. Now, just to make you feel a little bit better about that question, if, if we're right about a universe or nothing, it's most likely that our universe in fact is closed. But not our universe, but, well, our universe, but the re we only see a small region of our universe, and it looks flat. Just like if you live in Kansas, some of you do, I know, because I talked to you, there you are, it looks flat, okay? And that's because the Earth is pretty darn big. And we now think that our the, the flatness of the universe that we see is a consequence of inflation puffing up the universe to be so large that it blew it up like a large balloon and made it look flat. And our observable universe is really only a small subsection of what is probably a larger, maybe ultimately closed universe. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Chris Hardigan. Uh, I'm not a physicist, but I saw particle physics, or uh, particle fever. Oh, oh yeah. So, um, I, one of the things I remember was that the physicists, the theoretical physicists from Princeton, mm -hmm. you know, had a lot of, you know, they were, they were trash talking each other back and forth with the yeah. experimentalists, but he, after the, uh, after CERN released their data, he said that all his predictions were out the window, and they found this middle ground for the size of the, of the Higgs boson, yeah. which split the difference between multiverse and Super symmetry. Yeah, well, I didn't understand that after watching it twice. Well, good. It's good you didn't understand it because it doesn't have any content. Um, <laughs> okay, never mind then. Um, well, look, it, it's a you know these movies are, are are myopic, and I'm in a movie, so but I happily I didn't make it about myself. But anyway, um, and so they're always self-serving to some extent, and and um, so um, it is not true. Okay, the Higgs happen to fall in a range where where where. And this often happens in science, where it can't def definitively tell us what, what the next direction is. That's why we're very happy the Large Hadron Collider has been upgraded and will be turned on again in 2015. But, and so it is, a, it is in a range where, you, where there were certain models that, that, that uh, are now ruled out, but, and there, but there are a lot of other models that can't be distinguished. And it doesn't, it, it doesn't really pick, I mean, for his particular models, it's in the range where it distinguishes between a multiverse and not, but his models are no likely no not wrong, because most models are wrong. And so it, it's just way over over uh, analyzing that data right now. We don't know. The answer is it's a the Higgs fell in an amazingly interesting spot. It happens, you know. I'll give you an example. Um, when I was younger, and that was a long time ago, 
But the, the expansion rate of the universe, the universe is expanding. It was, it's expanding at a rate we now measure this, this thing called the Hubble constant, which in, in a certain yet set of units is 72, not 42, unfortunately. <laughs> Although one observer claimed it was 42 and never even knew why the joke. But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it was interesting because at the time when I was growing up, and this was an example of a problem in astrophysics which happily has changed, there were sets of observers that measured the Hubble constant to be 50 plus or minus 5, and there were other, a whole other set of observers that measured it to be 100 plus or minus 5. Now clearly there's something wrong with that claim because they both can't be right. Now guess what it ended up to be? About 75, right? Okay? Not too surprising. And so what, what's amazing about the Higgs, and I remember, uh, Vividly, three months before the observation was, 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 or the experimental observation was announced, the experimentalists ruled out everything below 125 GeV and everything above with a very small range. And they were so lethal, they said, we're going to rule out the Higgs. And there's only this little range left, and it's, and it's not anywhere else. Well, guess where it turned out to be? And, and that happens. And it's not expected, but that's what's wonderful about science. We'll see. Yeah, just a couple more. Oh, uh, Larry Lepton here. I'm only a lowly biologist, but... Well, you, no, you can be forgiven. <laughs> <laughs> Does the expansion of the universe occur above light speed? Or? Yes. Uh, uh, yeah, the, uh, in certain rate regions. The point is that you have to read... We teach... We, we lie when we teach physics in high school. That's why some people come to a biologist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, 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 so we tell people that nothing can go faster than the speed of light, and that's... You have to be more careful. You have to be like a lawyer and parse more carefully. Nothing can travel through space faster than the speed of light. But space can do whatever the hell it wants. And in, in an expanding universe, you can be moving and standing still at the same time. That's precisely what we're doing. Rel relative to the sun, we're not moving very fast. But relative to a galaxy at the other end of the visible universe, we're moving away at the speed of light. At a, a, at a, a posticon in that galaxy at the other end of the visible universe, those people are hanging around and they're also at rest. They're at rest with respect to their surroundings. We're at rest with respect to our surroundings. But we're moving apart with speed of light. How can that be the case? Well, we're at rest, we're at rest with the space between us and expanding. And space can carry things away from you faster than light, just like a surfer can, may not be moving fast on the water, but the water, if there's an undertow, can carry the surfer out faster than it can swim. Okay, sure. One more question? Sure. Sorry, but I'll, I'm around for other questions. Uh, my, my name is Dustin. Uh, can she not ask the last question? She just looks like she's so disappointed. <laughs> this is a pretty simple question, and the only reason I don't know the answer is to this is because I'm not a particle physicist. Uh, what exactly was it that was observed in the LHC that says this is the Higgs boson? You know, what, oh. what phenomena? I mean, was it a certain spin on a particle? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I exactly know. actually, I've, I've, I've talked about this, and I'm happy to say this is one of the key points in my in the book, next my next book, which is sort of takes off from universe from nothing. You know? different direction. So if, uh, I'll try and explain now, but the really good explanation you can wait for. It. Um, but it, it's quite simple. The Higgs is a particle. And if it's if it has if the Higgs field has the properties it has, it gives mass to particles. Because certain particles interact more strongly with it and experience more resistance. It's like swimming in molasses. So certain particles interact with it more strongly and therefore get slowed down. Okay, and act more massive. Other particles like photons don't interact with it at all and go at the speed of light. And if it wasn't there, all particles would be traveling at the speed of light. Okay? But that tells us that the Higgs, it tells us the strength of the Higgs's interactions with each particle in nature is proportional to their mass. Now the Higgs is heavy, and it can decay into particles. So, but we know the interaction strength of the particles that both produce the Higgs and into which the Higgs decays, because the Higgs gives particles mass. So, the, so what we expect is with a, with a known strength, for if you take two protons, which have quarks, which have a certain mass, and enough energy together, you might expect to produce a certain number of Higgses. And then you look, those Higgses are unstable. They last for about a, a, again, in this case, a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a second. Okay? They decay into the known particles. But they decay in a very unique way, because they decay in a way that's determined by the strength of their interaction to those particles. So we, we predict that if the Higgs is produced, it should produce so many muons and so many uh, other kind of particles in a certain kind of, and so many, uh, turns out, particles of light, gamma rays. And what was observed was exactly the decay spectrum you would expect from the particle that would couple the particles by their mass. 
Moreover, it turns out it, it, the properties of that particle is called a scalar particle. It means it decays uniformly, more or less, in all directions. Again, the characteristics of the, of the decay products were that. So again, it walked like a duck and quacked like a duck. But unlike the, this experiment, the difference between an experiment and an observation is huge. Because in an experiment, you have control over systematic errors. In an observation, you don't. Okay, that's why the observation of biceps is subject to things you can't control. You can't twist the dials in, a, in the universe. But in the laboratory, you can. And so they were able to twist all the dials and say with a confidence of 99.9999995% likelihood that, the, that, the, that this was a Higgs. And that's enough for us to say, yeah, it's probably Higgs. <laughs> <laughs> Last, can we do it quickly? Last question. How many? Yeah. How many pairs of Converse shoes do you own? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and what's my shoe size? And what's your favorite color? Okay, well, let's see. Some of it's pretty personal. But, um, <laughs> um, uh, okay, so I own many different pairs of Converse, and more all the time, because it, as, as it has become a, a, apparently a trademark. If I happen to wear them, and now they're on. So I think I probably own, although I've given some away. Happily to, uh, doc I think there was a there was a charity drive for Doctors Without Borders, and some people wanted to buy my used shoes. Which, you know, I was going to throw in used underwear too. Just like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but I think I probably don't own more than twenty different pairs at this point, and um, and there are many different colors and patterns, and um, and I just um, the interesting thing is um, I am colorblind, and um, and so uh, my wife actually helps me generally pick out colors so that I can not be contrasting, but then I don't really care if I am, so I like them. <laughs> and I think in, 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 the, in U.S. Congress, I'm a nine, for those who want to. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.